Thank you, Mark. Well, it's impossible to uh, live up to uh, such an embellished introduction. Uh, appreciate that very much. I, I'm really glad to be back here. Uh, I have so many great memories in here uh, of chapels, of uh, the, the eagles trouncing Azusa Pacific, uh, all kinds of wonderful, happy memories in this very building. And so it's a privilege to be back and to uh, be on the tail end here of a series on suffering. Uh, you know, the world promises all sorts of things. I don't have to tell you that. You can turn on the TV, see the advertising, better teeth, better hair, better bank accounts. Well, not so much that anymore. Uh, better health. And the church is expected in this kind of a culture to provide the goods too. The church is expected to tell people how God exists to make us happy how God is there to make sure that we're having our best life now. And what we easily do in this kind of a culture is make God a supporting actor in our life movie. Instead of realizing that we have a supporting role in his story that has been unfolding from Genesis to Revelation. And that brings us to John 11, where I'll be focusing our thoughts here briefly on the resurrection. And here, the resurrection, not of Jesus, but of Lazarus, which is a sign of the coming resurrection of Jesus. And let me read verses 17 to 37. Now, when Jesus came, this is John 11, verse 17. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. In John's gospel especially, the words of Jesus are so tied to the signs. The signs, the purpose of Jesus' miracles, especially in the gospel of John, is to certify the claim that he makes in the words that he tells about himself. So he feeds the 5,000 and says, I am the bread of life. And here, Jesus is about to raise Lazarus from the dead to announce that he is the resurrection and the life. And of course, the religious leaders of Jesus' day never went beyond the signs. When it came to the bread, they said, give us more. That was a great free lunch. They crossed the lake to the other side because it's dinner time now. And Jesus says, you're not following me because you believe what the signs refer to, coming to me in order to have life, but because you ate and had your fill. Does that sound like our culture? And so use God for your happiness here and now. Make him a supporting actor in your life movie. And if you're not completely satisfied, simply return the unused portion for a full refund. This passage really messes us up in that respect. First of all, in the passage previous to the one I read, the section of chapter 11 previous, we read that Lazarus, Mary, and Martha were in Bethany where Jesus had sort of made their home his home base because it was so close to Jerusalem. And it was that Mary, says John, who anointed the Lord. That Mary who later, before Jesus would go to the cross, poured out that expensive perfume. It was, it was that Mary Magdalene and her sister Martha and brother Lazarus we're talking about here in this story. And Lazarus is described as he whom you love. And so we're meant to realize the deep connection, the deep bond of love that Jesus has with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They really were the, the home base in many respects for his Jerusalem ministry, his forays into the city. 
And the assumption here is that Jesus and Lazarus are so close that all Jesus needed was to know that his friend Lazarus was dying, that he was ill, and he would come running. But we read in verses 4 through 7, but when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified in it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. It's odd. Doesn't that strike you as kind of odd? Lazarus is dying. He loved him so much that he stayed on the other side of the Jordan River for two more days as his friend Lazarus lay dying. Jesus had immediately healed the daughter of Jairus. Why didn't he immediately heal Lazarus? Why didn't he come running to heal his friend? Why did he stay there if he loved them so much? Why did he stay there for two more days? If you were here, Martha says, our brother would not have died. Martha was always sort of the direct. She just got it out, just said it. Well, if you had been here, he would be fine. He'd be standing here today, and I thought you loved him. I thought you cared about him. And the plea isn't wrong. You find that kind of plea throughout the Psalms. Where are you, God? Why are you hiding your face from me? But you see, they didn't understand that their story was a subplot in his story, not vice versa. I always ask, why is this happening to me, or what is God t- trying to teach me through this? When people in, with the best of intentions push that on us when we're suffering, it's just more suffering. It's not a time for us to, we can't figure out the secret plans of God. We don't know why he does things, unless he reveals it in scripture. But there's an unfolding plot that is bigger than our own lives. The glorification of the Son of God as the Messiah is the real story here, and it's unfolding before our very eyes. So Jesus deliberately stays Two more days. Can you imagine what was going through the sisters' minds? What was going through Lazarus' mind? They had no idea what Jesus was going to do, something far greater than they had asked him to do. They just didn't have enough data at their disposal. They didn't know the larger story of which they were a part. And so Jesus now, after two days, tells the disciples, okay, we're going to go back into Judea, and we learn from chapter Uh, chapter 10, that that wasn't a very wise thing from the perspective of the disciples because Jesus had just been on the steps of the, the, the colonnade of the temple, healing and pronouncing himself the son of God, and the religious leaders took up stones to stone him for blasphemy. And so the disciples say, what, you're, you're joking, we're going back into Judea, we're going back into that region in the environs around Jerusalem just after we escaped narrowly with our lives, Jesus said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep and I go to awaken him. The disciples said, "Uh, if he's fallen asleep, he'll wake up. And Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe in me. But now let's go to him. See, that was the purpose. That was the point. I'm glad that I wasn't there simply to bring him back to health. I'm glad that for the sake of your faith in me. See, the, the biggest problem is not that we are dying physically, but that we are dead spiritually in trespasses and sins. That's the greater problem that Jesus came to solve. And ultimately, because he solved that problem, we will live. We will be raised on the last day. But Lazarus is dead. He is not unwell. He is, he's actually dead. I love Thomas. I identify with Thomas. Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, you can imagine him, he doesn't say it directly to Jesus, he just sort of grumbles and grouses, looks over at the other disciples and says, well, then let's go also so that we may die with him. Sarcastic Thomas. 
But Jesus goes, and the disciples go with him. And we have a confrontation with his loved ones in verses 17 through 27. Martha, first of all, entreats Jesus. She's more willing to express her frustration than her sister Mary. Her sister Mary, Martha, has to call out of the house. She's sulking. Mary Magdalene is not sure how she can express her thoughts well to Jesus since she's so angry. Martha just comes barreling out of the house. And yet, even though she expresses her frustration with Jesus, Martha says, and yet I know that even now, after he has been in the tomb for four days, anything is possible with you. You see, that's what genuine faith does. It allows us to cry out in pain and frustration, and I don't know what you're doing, and yet even now, even in this pain, even in this suffering, I know who you are. I don't know what you're doing, but I know who you are, and I know the overarching plot that is unfolding, and I know that I am not the main player in this drama. Jesus asks Martha, you know, you know your brother will rise again, and Martha says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. She was a good Pharisee. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead on the last day. And uh, so she has her theology straight, but Jesus is asking for more than the right answer on a quiz. There's something more important going on here than simply assenting to the belief that he will be raised in the final resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Not just in a general doctrine of the resurrection of the dead, but do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? The man standing before you, the, the man who ate from your table, do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life, and that whoever believes in me will live forever? And Martha says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. That is the point of this micro story. A micro story, part of a macro story of redemption. That's the point. Something happened that was more important that day than Lazarus's personal health here and now. And that was that Martha, and not only Martha, but through her witness and through Jesus' teaching and his sign that day, so many Jews in the surrounding environs came to believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now she had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And the two verbs that are used here, are the, the first one is for a horse's snort. When it says that he was deeply moved in his spirit. He was, he, 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 he was snorting like a horse and greatly troubled. The same verb that is used when Herod was troubled at the announcement of the Magi, a king had been born in Israel, or troubled when the disciples saw Jesus stilling the waters and they were terribly afraid. That's how Jesus felt now. Jesus was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Isn't that interesting? In five minutes, he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. You'd think he'd just sort of walk over and sort of with a smile on his face say, don't worry, be happy. Don't worry, this is all right, no problem. 
Why did he do it? He did it because he was on death's home turf. He was on the home turf of Satan whom he would defeat at his own resurrection. He looked death in the eye, the real enemy of Jesus, greater than any Roman army or Sanhedrin. He looked death in the face, he saw it, and he was deeply troubled. He was deeply burdened in his soul. He was mixed up emotionally. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Jesus broke down crying. You've seen those scenes, especially in the Middle East, when there is a, a, a tragedy and mothers and fathers throw themselves on the coffins or they are uh, enwrapped in, in uh, uh, emotional despondency and that's what Jesus felt here. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? And then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb, said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of Lazarus, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he's been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And so they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you have sent me. And when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Finally, Jesus takes the place not of the Savior they were expecting, but in this moment, in this parenthesis, finds himself as one of the mourners. Jesus overthrows the stoic conception of reality here in the way that, that he stares death in the face. Even though he knows he will be victorious over death, it still is the Christian's last enemy, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. I, when my dad was dying in a convalescent hospital, there was this horrible tapestry uh, in the nursing home uh, that said, uh, had all of the different phases of life from youth to old age, and it says the sun's setting is as beautiful as it's rising. I just wanted to tear that thing down. I thought, what a, what a nuisance this must be to all of these people who, who are hanging on IVs and drooling, hoping to die because life is so unbearable, life is so difficult. This is as good as childbirth. This is as good as your birthday party with friends at six years old. This is as good as learning how to ride a bike. This is not. This is horrible. Death is horrible. And sometimes when we call funeral celebrations today in Christian circles, it's more Christian science than Christianity. Mary Becker Eddy gave us the phrase, passing away. That's because Mary Baker Eddy and Christian Science don't believe that death is real, that evil is real. But Jesus did. Jesus acknowledged evil. He stared it in the face. And even though he knew he was going to triumph over it, it scared him to death. But Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. Martha trusted Jesus when she moved away the stone. She had given her confession of faith, and now she moved away the stone. In John 5, 28, Jesus said, For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear my voice and come forth. And Martha probably remembered that saying of Jesus. Jesus' own resurrection will be the first fruits of those who sleep. And so you see this resurrection of Lazarus is not really the point of the story. The resurrection of Lazarus is how it's listed here in many of our texts, but really it should be the confession of Jesus as the Christ, the first fruits of those who sleep. 
Lazarus is an object lesson. Lazarus is a sign that that kingdom is breaking in on this present evil age, and soon death's grip will be loosened. The response is mixed, as it always is, even down to the present day. And in verse 9 of chapter 12, we read, When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. And then John closes his gospel by saying, I could have told you about a lot of miracles that Jesus did, but these are enough. These are included so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and believing have everlasting life in his name. That's the point. That's the point of Lazarus' life. That's the point of the man born blind. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither, Jesus said, but so that the Son of Man might be glorified, he was born blind. The good news is that death is the last enemy. Death is an enemy. Death is not a portal to life. Death is not a nice bridge, a passageway. Death is horrible. But the sting of death has been taken away because the law which condemns us makes death itself the last word. The reason death isn't the last word for us is because the condemnation of the law has been removed from us. Death is still an enemy, but it's the last enemy. The last enemy that we will ever face. Our ultimate hope, our ultimate hope is not having our best life now. Our ultimate hope is not having a great life movie with God as a supporting actor. Our greatest hope is not even going to heaven when we die. Our greatest hope is the resurrection of our bodies on the last day. Lazarus would die again. He would live for a while and then he would die. Lazarus wasn't resurrected in the same state that Jesus was resurrected on Easter or in the same state in which we will be resurrected on the last day. He would go back, he would die, he would join the dead until that time when, together with us, Lazarus will be raised in glory and triumph. He was raised by Jesus here, still mortal, still tending toward death. The clock would pick up where it left off in Lazarus' decay, and eventually he would die again, but not after Jesus' resurrection. And surely there were people present at Lazarus' grave, or at least heard news about it, who would hear news that first Easter that one greater than Lazarus has experienced a resurrection greater than the one at Lazarus' tomb. And because the guilt and judgment for your sins are removed, because there is therefore now, right now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We can both cry out with our Lord in troubled anger, confusion, perplexity, frustration, and yet also sing with the apostle, oh hell, where is your victory? Oh death, where is your sting? Because in all of our times of suffering and pain, we are not the point of the story. We are the supporting characters who are drawn into Jesus' story of redemption. And because of that, it isn't our labors, our works, our responses, what we can manage, what we can handle, but God and his saving work in Jesus Christ that really matters. Christ is risen indeed. Even greater than that, he is the resurrection and the life. Let's pray. Great Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son, not just to perform many signs and wonders to wow the crowds or even to point to his divinity, but more importantly, to actually solve 
that greater problem that we have than all of life's troubles, namely the condemnation that leads to our everlasting death. Father, we know that we will have troubles. We know that we will have trials. We know that in many of these cases, we will never understand why you allowed them to come our way. And yet we know that our only comfort in life and in death is that we are not our own, but belong in both body and soul and in life and in death to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.